the masked rider. That would have been Neil Peart in Western Africa on your bicycle. Consuming this, you talk about those who travel for pleasure and find adventure and those who travel for adventure and find pleasure. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and what you like to do is think about it, anticipate it beforehand, savor it after the fact. Yeah, it's, it's one of the lures, I think I was saying before, the real draw is curiosity. And when I think about yeah. a country like Mali or a country like Cameroon or, or Mexico or Tunisia, any of them, I, oh, I really want to go there. I really want to see what it's like. And then you, you get all excited about planning it and where you can go and what it will be like. But then the actual living on a day-to-day -day basis can be pretty uncomfortable. If you're traveling by bicycle or, or doing any of the things if you're traveling by bus, there are no guided tours to these places. Mm -hmm. There are no air-conditioned buses. Mm -hmm. There is no other way to get there but the hard way. So you have to face that as being the price of admission. That's the ticket that you're going to have to buy to get there. Yeah. But day by day, you know, you can have dysentery, you can be homesick, you can be out of water. <laughs> all kinds of really unpleasant things on an existential basis can really mess up your mood. So um, that, that isn't always a pleasurable way to pass your moments. But at the end of it, again, uh, when it's over and you're on the way home or at home working on my journal and fleshing out and all that, it's beautiful it to think about back. it. Yeah, and you, you know, go back Washington. to the history and all the good stuff comes back, like is often said about any physical trauma, you forget the bad stuff. Yes. And it's true of those kind of trips too. And I find that the unpleasant episodes are an important part of the story, and of course I include them, but I hate to write them, I hate to revise them, I hate to reread them because it forces me to engage all over again into that awful experience of having a drunken soldier point a gun at me or, you know, writhing in bed with stomach cramps and yeah. dysentery. I hate to live them again, so I hate to reread them and I hate to revise them, but of course it's one of the, the little uh, birth pangs of writing a book, I guess. You write at the end of the book about your arrival back in Paris mm. and the, the sheer joy of the material world and your ability to consume at will. Yes, um, and everyone else's ability too, it must yeah. be pointed out. It wasn't at all a selfish thing, it was gloriously <laughs> universal. I was looking around at all these people, they were riding on the bus and they weren't all crammed, you know, 35 people into a bus that holds 15. They were all sitting on the bus like dignified human beings and people driving by and walking by with pride and freedom and not having guns pointed at them and not, have, not being stopped every two blocks and asked why they're carrying a camera or anything mm -hmm. like that. So that was a glorious thing and looking in the windows and seeing things people could buy and people that could buy them. And it, it came down to the mundane, most trivial little thing, souvenirs. You know, I would look at souvenir Eiffel Towers and go, I could buy that if I wanted. <laughs> I mean, it was just this complete return to, to the familiar world, I guess, in I mean, which every little trinket was precious. It's almost politically incorrect to admit to that. Well, yes, but it's also politically incorrect to take the romance out of a place like West Africa and to say that, yes, it's nice you can go to a village and not hear any sound but conversation. And that is a beautiful thing. But at the same time, there isn't a doctor for 100 miles. Mm. You know, there's, there's a, the, the, the nearest clean water is three miles away. I mean, you have to come down and, and little children with their eyes running with pus and blind and their parents begging you for medicine. I mean, these are the realities mm -hmm. that force you to confront both and make you come back valuing everything so preciously and not wanting to hear petty complaints about everything. And not life. sort of dismiss this materialism as, as something that is just an indulgence. Yeah, I mean, materialism is the medicine that would restore that little baby's sight, yeah. you know, and that their father or mother is begging me for that medicine as if I were a doctor and I have to explain to them in laboring French that, sorry, I'm a bicycle rider, not a doctor, yeah. and I have nothing to help. And you had this, this wonderful description at one point about how you know, you, and, and not sort of idolizing uh, some of these situations you're in where, you know, to some people, many people, a Stradivarius would simply be firewood. Kindling for the fire, yeah. And that, you know, the, the works of the great thinkers just uh, to get the fire going. It's a part of the reward of traveling in those places is putting your values back in sync. And on one group, we had a saying one time, the decline of Western values, and it was our catchphrase every day. You know, no matter what low we were brought to and where we would sleep or what we would eat or what we would drink, it was the joke. You know, here's the decline of Western values. I had two warm Coca-Colas at 6.30 in the morning because that's all there was for breakfast. You know, it's <laughs> all I could find. Uh, that becomes, you know, it's in some ways it's incon inconceivable from a home point yes. of view, but when, you're, when survival's at stake and if you can get a crust of, a crust of bread and a, a warm pop, you'll take it. Yeah. I'm assuming that because Rush has been so successful and 30 million albums have been sold that you've got a fair amount of pocket change here, that you're uh, not yeah, starving. I have a privileged life too, which is another reason yeah. I'm glad to exchange that for... So that really is part of that. So I want to keep my values straight. You know, I, I come from a, a non-privileged background and uh, I, I do want to hold on to those values and not be warped by it. And it's been one of my problems for all of us, we all come from normal neighborhoods, you know, and, and normal families, and, and we really do value that, and mm -hmm. we've helped each other, fortunately. 
being a, a group, we've been able to help each other stay in line and not go spinning off on those tangents. But at the same time, travels like this help me to keep in, in mind what really matters. And if you spend all day looking for water, that's, that's how your life might be spent. You describe yourself as apolitical. Can you describe your values, though? Um, human life, I, I, to me, is, is the fundamental value of all, and that's why I get impatient with some of the things that I see in places like this with misguided foreign aid, where they're spending time and money um, buying people religious tracts and teaching them how to read mm -hmm. religious tracts instead of digging a well, right. instead of helping bring, bring the ointment for that little girl so her eyes can be disinfected, you know? Th these are the things that I want to see done and I come home all militant about trying to get them done and I run into walls or, or simple things like family planning where yeah. it's it, yeah. is, um, a lot of Islamic countries or, or certain um, ethnocentric countries, they consider it a white plot, a western plot to introduce any kind of birth control or family planning into those countries. They think you're just trying to eradicate the black race. But when you go there and see the, all the little girls lined up at the, at the water tap to gather water, and all of the little boys all the same age, because more than half the country is under 14 years old, yeah. um, you have to be stung by that from basic, the values of basic human life. And because we, as Western aid providers, have brought clean water to a lot of these villages, and certainly that's an admirable thing, what should you do? Like I said, it's better to bring that than a religious tract or build mm -hmm. a church. But at the same time, because there's clean water, more children survive. But the parents haven't quite adjusted to that, so they keep having more children. So where in Mali, for instance, two children out of five used to survive, now it's more like four out of five. But they still keep having as many children. But if you try to get active in those areas and saying, look, you people, you, yeah. you know, you really, I hate to see your children suffer and I wish they didn't have to. Do, do you want to consider contraception? <laughs> and you just can't. It, it becomes a racist plot and an anti-religious plot and all kinds of bad things politically that you can't deal I, with. I take it you're a little annoyed with organized religion these Well, days. politics too. Again, it's, it's the apolitical aspect. Yeah. For me, I want people to be happy. I want people to be healthy. That's my, those are my values and there's nothing more important than that. Religion is not more important than life. Politics are not more important than life to me. And when I see these people suffering or their children suffering, I don't want it to be that way. You know, I want to do something worthwhile to help. Neil Peart is our guest tonight. He has just authored The Masked Rider about his adventure travels through Africa. And of course, his band Rush has a new album out to test for echo. We'll continue our conversation right after this break.